Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to see uh, everyone here in person and everyone here on the dais. It's amazing. I would like to uh, adjourn the Board of Education closed session. There are no reportable items. And reconvene the regular Board of Education open session at 6.32 PM. We are going to begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by some very special students from Monrovia Adult School, that um, Principal Fertig. Mr. Fertig, will you be introducing them? Thank you so much. Board President Lockerbie, um, Vice President Kolar, members of the school board, uh, Superintendent Dr. Smith, and cabinet. It's an honor um, for me to be able to introduce these three students. They're part of our citizenship program at the Adult Ed. Um, there are a lot of programs that do a lot of things in Monroe Unified School District. None are more important, I believe, than this one. Uh, these students come, they study very hard, and if you've ever wanted to renew your patriotism, if you ever wanted to better understand our country and what it means to other people, join us anytime in that classroom. We have a special and wonderful teacher I'd like to invite to join me here really quickly, um, Ms. Carol Burrell, <laughs> who will give you just a very brief synopsis and then introduce our students. Okay. Good evening. Uh, President Lockerbie, Superintendent Smith, board members, cabinet, and members of Monrovia community. Um, yes, my name is Carol Burrell, and I'm the citizenship teacher at Monrovia Adult School, and we are honored to have been selected to lead this board meeting in the Pledge of Allegiance and to uh, represent Monrovia Adult School Citizenship class. At this time, I'd like to pass the mic over to Chia Yin Lee, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd now like to give you a brief introduction to our citizenship program, and then I'll give you a chance to hear a little bit from our students who are pursuing US citizenship. In order to qualify for citizenship, applicants must demonstrate knowledge of US history, government, the ability to listen, speak, understand, write English at, a, at least a basic level, they must agree with the principles of the U.S. Constitution, and they must have good moral character. Uh, along with a lengthy written application and background check by USCIS, they must pass a face-to-face -face interview with a immigration officer. And here are some common questions that they're asked at that interview. Um, Hannes Born Leck will answer my first question. Why do you want to become a U.S. citizen? I love America and I want to vote. <clears throat> Tran Li will answer the next question. How are you eligible to become a U.S. citizen? I got married with a U.S. citizen, and I got a green card over three years. <laughs> and Chia Yin Li will answer the next question. Do you believe in and support the U.S. Constitution and the form of government of the U.S.? Yes, I do. Don't go away. <laughs> what is the Constitution? It's the supreme law of the land. We've got to be tough. What is the form of government of the United States? The Republic. 
Very good. I'd, I'd like to mention that there is one student who could not be here this evening. Her name is Rosa Pineda, and I'm happy to say that she passed her interview and became a U.S. citizen just this morning. So she is celebrating with her family tonight. Um, I should also mention that Tran Lee has her interview just next week. So. Yes, we're wishing her a lot of good luck. So it was a pleasure for the citizenship class to open the board meeting this evening. Thank you so much. The pleasure was most definitely ours. Would you honor us with um, a picture? We would be honored. Okay. And thank you all again for being here and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Moving on to our next item, roll call. All board members are present. Superintendent Dr. Smith, Cabinet, and our student board member are all present. And um, as I did mention at the beginning, the report out for a closed session, there were no reportable items. And we're moving on to order of business. Dr. Smith, are there uh, any changes in the order of business? Uh, Madam President, there are not. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to approval of the minutes of the regular Board of Education meeting mm -hmm. of March 23rd. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? Ms. Huff, would you please call the roll? Call Board the vote. Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golard? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Moving on to recognitions and communications. I believe there are no board member reports today, correct? Moving on to our student board member report. Good evening, Board President Lockerbie, members of the board, cabinet, and community. For my report, I'd like to share a few recent upcoming events taking place at MHS. On Thursday, April 14th, Renaissance Leadership will be hosting Mr. Monrovia in the auditorium at 7 p.m. Tickets are $5 and are sold at our student store and will also be sold at the door. On Friday, April 15th, Battle of the Bands will be hosted at the Friendship Circle at Monrovia High School from 6 to 10 p.m. On April 26th, Renaissance is hosting their People's Choice Awards. And Sign on the Line for Seniors will be getting soon and will be during lunch. And I will also be signing for my commitment to Cal State University, Long Beach. And that, that concludes you. Congratulations on that. That is amazing. And moving on to our report from the superintendent, Dr. Smith. 
Uh, thank you, President Lockerbie. Uh, just a few things to update, be but before I do, I uh, wanted to welcome everybody back from a much deserved uh, and, and very, very well deserved spring break. Uh, I hope that our staff, our teachers, our students and their families all were able to enjoy some of that time away and were able to kind of relax and recharge as we move down into the home stretch, so to speak. Uh, the march towards graduation begins, you know, it began a while ago, but it uh, really picks up pace now as we move towards our graduations and promotions. So an exciting time of year and lots of wonderful end of the year events to celebrate along the way. So really excited about all of that. So the first update that I have is I just wanted to remind the, our parents, families, community members, as well as our students, that we do have a follow-up COVID-19 vaccine clinic on April 16th at MHS. It will be in room 210. We will be providing the booster shot for those who are eligible. Um, all are welcome, whoever is eligible. And appointments are recommended. However, they're not necessary. So if folks want to walk in and do that, that would be just fine. So again, we're very proud to be able to offer the opportunity for our community to receive booster shots for COVID-19. Uh, and we encourage those uh, who are eligible and are interested to go ahead and do so. And so we're offering that opportunity at our high school. The other thing that I wanted to update everyone on is an event that Monrovians know quite well. And as being a new member of the Monrovia family, I am very excited about Monrovia Days. Our team has been preparing for Monrovia Days along with the city of Monrovia and others to make this annual event, which is so incredible and so special, uh, even more fantastic this year as we return back to really a true sense of normalcy. And as you know, the tradition has been on Friday for MHS to lead the way with a pep rally. So I'm very excited about that on Friday, May 13th. And then on Friday, May, or Saturday, May 14th, we have the parade, which our team will be participating in. I believe we'll all be participating in the parade. I'm told a horse-drawn carriage, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then our schools will be very well represented throughout the day. It's an exciting opportunity to showcase our schools, our programs, and all that we have to offer um, to our community and from those to those beyond who uh, come to enjoy that, that with us. And hopefully um, we encourage more and more people to enroll in our schools. The other thing that I wanted to mention as part of my superintendent's update is an opportunity that our partners at Monrovia Reads are putting forth their annual uh, 20th annual. So All May Read fundraiser is coming up on May 19th at the Double. Tree Hilton in Monrovia. Um, it is a fantastic organization that does a tremendous amount of work to support our students and our schools and really foster a love of reading and improving literacy uh, for students of all ages. Uh, at this particular fundraiser, this annual fundraiser, we're also celebrating and honoring Miss Annette Simpson, the youth librarian at the Monrovia Public Library. And if you don't know uh, Annette Simpson, um, she's incredible. I mean, just incredible. All about our kids and all about our community and such a tremendous resource and asset. So a well-deserved recognition and honor. So again, anyone who's interested in participating in this and supporting Monrovia Reads, highly recommend that you do so. It will be an evening to remember. Um, and again, my first time participating in this specific event, and I'm really excited about it and really looking forward to it. The last part of my update, um, is something I just wanted to share. This is a, a more recent development, and I wanted to make sure that I, I gave this person a specific shout out. Uh, as the board knows, on Thursday, we have our annual PTA Founders Day celebration um, with our council, and I'm really excited about that. And it is with great pleasure, and she's already rolling her eyes in the back <laughs> of the room, um, that I share with everyone publicly that my administrative assistant, um, Shoshana Huff, has been selected by the Monrovia Council of PTAs unanimously um, for the California PTA Honorary Service Award for Outstanding Administrator. Uh, Shoshana is so well, so well deserving of this recognition. Um, the work that she does, the tireless work that she does for the board, for our principals, teachers, staff, community members, um, is nothing short of spectacular. 
keeping me in line, making sure I'm where I need to be and not forgetting things is probably the most difficult part of her job. Um, and I am so grateful. Shoshana, this is a well-deserved honor, and I can't wait to celebrate with everybody else this recognition for you. And if I were to ask Shoshana to come up and give a speech, she would kill me, so I will not do that. I will not do that, but I did want to make sure that we recognize you, so congratulations, Shoshana. Madam President, this concludes my superintendent's report. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Moving on to public comments. The Board of Education encourages public participation and invites you to share your views on school business. Um, please complete the card that is in the um, foyer and hand it to Ms. Huff prior to the meeting and in order to accomplish board business in a timely and efficient manner, we ask that you limit your public comments to about three minutes per person. Public comments for items not on the agenda in compliance with the Brown Act. Items not on the agenda legally cannot be discussed by the board tonight. We welcome your input, but are limited to asking clarifying questions and gathering contact information. Ms. Huff, are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? Uh, yes, Board President Lockerbie. We have one public comment from Mr. Dave Hart. Thank you. I want to make sure you don't have to time yourself okay oh good even better um, I'd like to thank you President Lockerbie uh, esteemed board Dr. Smith and cabinet for this opportunity um, I had some people suggest that it probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to come up and speak but I've gotten my golden double ARP ARP card so I get to go ahead and ignore what they say no um, all this week Sweet Ethan's is running a fundraiser all day long, and probably just about every school is, <laughs> is hosting it. So you could go and mention any school, but I'm gonna encourage you to mention Santa Fe with one of your purchases to benefit uh, RPTA and the job they do. But you can go and get a little something for everybody. So I'm inviting you to do that. The other is May the 4th be with you. And this is your invitation to Santa Fe's next grand concert, uh, musical concert. So please, on the 4th, put that on your schedule if it's not already, uh, in the evening. <laughs> I'm going to guess 6.30, Mr. Hammond, but I, I, I will clarify that timing. But please, if you can, I know we've had tremendous support, and that's great. And then I'm just going to sneak in two more. Uh, Flint Fertig. What a tremendous individual. He's, he's working at, I don't know, he's principal at four schools now, I think. I don't know. He's everywhere, and he's just an amazing man and the best. And I want to take an opportunity to thank Sue Kaiser for her years of dedicated service. Thank you. So. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Ms. Huff, do we have any other comments for items not on the agenda? There are none. Thank you. Do we have any public comments for items on the open session agenda? There are none. Thank you. Moving on to staff presentations. Canyon Early Learning Center and Village Program update by oh, Sue Kaiser. It's by Sue Kaiser. And I'd like Tom McFadden to and join me at the podium, please. <clears throat> Good evening, Board President Lockerbie, Board members, Superintendent Smith, fellow cabinet members, and our esteemed community. Tonight, we're fortunate to hear a presentation from Tom McFadden, the Director of Expanded Learning Programs, Canyon Early Learning Center, known as CELC, and the Village Extended School Programs. Canyon Early Learning Center has an amazing staff. They are a kindness certified school. And if that doesn't make you want to attend a preschool, I don't know what does, uh, to go to a place that's kind. They've received grant funding from the California Preschool Network for materials and supplies. And extra, there's an extra special feature at the CLC, and that's the community partnership with Monrovia Reads that Tom will talk about. They have been a viable partner, and they've contributed to students in so many ways by supporting with books and teaching students the magic of books and 
as reading is their mission that is being fulfilled in a magnificent way through the relationship with Monrovia Reads. They also provide extensive parent involvement and parent education, teaching parents about how to draw their students into enjoying books. At Village, we have some highlights too that Tom will be um, going over. And one of the things that is um, very wonderful about our village program, which is the after school and the pro and before school program at our sites, is that three of our sites have been named California Distinguished Healthy Behavior Sites. So I think that you're seeing a theme in the programs that Tom runs. Um, healthy behaviors, kindness. Um, they've also been recognized by the state of California whereby our own students went up and testified to the legislature, if you can believe that. And I happened to be there that day and I was able to watch them with poise and grace because they had been prepared to do such a thing in Sacramento and their testimony resulted in additional funding for all extended learning programs in the state of California. Here to share the details with us tonight is Tom McFadden, who's an excellent leader of these programs that provide so much to our students in this community. Tom? Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, and I also want to thank you for your years of service here in Monrovia. Um, Board President Lockerbie, members of the school board, uh, Dr. Smith, members of cabinet, it's my pleasure and really I'm proud uh, to be able to talk to uh, the programs that I have the privilege of leading along with some um, initiatives from the state of California that are, uh, that are on hand and we'll be going through those uh, here in a little bit. So if I could get the next slide, please. Um, the, tonight's objectives will be to give overviews of um, CELC and our open house, which just happened uh, right before spring vacation, uh, the universal pre-kindergarten planning and updates, a village program overview, extended learning opportunities program overview, and finally uh, a planning and next steps uh, so that we can see where we are at with these initiatives. Next slide, please. So. Um, we're going to begin with our CELC program overview. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to, uh, as Dr. Kaiser mentioned, our su super staff. Uh, we have amazing families and students, as you can see a, a couple of them pictured here um, in one of the classrooms. We, we are currently serving 165 students uh, across different programs that we offer at CELC, 27 special education students, 24 full day students, and the bulk of our uh, students are, are in our half-day uh, programs, either in the AM or PM, and we have a wait list of, of 19 students currently. Um, so we're serving a lot of students. We look to serve more, which I will talk about here in a second. Next slide, please. Um, our instructional focus um, is on developing language and reasoning skills. We've had a lot of support, as was mentioned, from Monrovia Reads, a big shout out to Monrovia Reads and my friend Janet Wall, who I know is watching this presentation. Um, <laughs> uh, we um, have uh, uh, language and development uh, a a as a crux of what we do, uh, in addition to all the other preschool uh, things that we want to develop as we get them ready for kindergarten, which is the end goal. Um, so vocabulary development, grammar, letter recognition, writing skills, developing reasoning skills, numeracy, and as you can see, reading is such a big part of what we do that we um, grabbed Dr. Francois, who was able to help us on our, uh, our, on our Dr. Seuss day, and those students really loved uh, the reading. In fact, they would not let him go after he read like four or five or <laughs> 10 different books as we were, as we were closing out the uh, PM session. Next slide, please. So we have lots of different things that we do uh, intentionally that look like play, but are really learning. And that's, that is actually our motto, is to learn while you play and play while you learn, because we know that's what's most engaging and developmentally appropriate for preschool students. Our learning and our activities are aligned to the preschool foundations and framework. Those are our standards. Um, we have three and four-year-old professional learning communities of teachers that design our curriculum and the learning activities that are aligned to those uh, foundations and framework. And so you can see some of these students uh, playing, but it is really learning uh, those, those pr uh, preschool uh, foundations and frameworks uh, that we have mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I'm most proud about is our parents. 
uh, our parents love dropping their kids off to school <laughs> and our kids love coming to school. Uh, CELC is a great place for them to be. Um, they are excited to be there. Our parents are excited to participate in what we do um, as a school. Um, so some examples of our uh, parent involvement include our Cubtastic assemblies. Cubtastic is our, is our approach to PBIS for three, four, and five-year-olds. Uh, so we just call what we do, like, are you being Cubtastic? Awesome, let's, let's keep that going. Um, we have parent education classes led by our friends from Monrovia Reads. We have another one coming up uh, in a couple of weeks where we partner with the teacher and we partner with the parents to teach them how to teach their kids at home. Uh, so some of our parents <laughs> have, have wondered, like, I don't even know how to read to my child. And we just had some feedback today, as a matter of fact, on how the, how the parents are engaging with their students at home presentation on. So there's a lot of alignment, uh, and we're really proud of that partnership, as I mentioned, with Monrovia Reads. We have lots of different uh, family engagement events. We have uh, a, a playground area that is fairly new to us that we utilize in lots of different ways with a lot of uh, lakeshore uh, materials and things that are on it. Um, we have movie nights. We, do, we, we want to be able to engage the families because uh, we know that when they're engaged, the students are engaged, and that's why they run to school uh, uh, in the mornings and the afternoon. So we're really, really proud about that. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, slide is, is actually a snapshot of some of the uh, academic um, things that go on with CELC. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see the, the, the rubric here is uh, the percentage of students meeting or exceeding standards. And what really that speaks to is how far along are these students uh, towards being kindergarten ready. And we can measure that through a tool that we have called the Desired Results Developmental Profile. It's what we submit to the state that we assess the students in twice a year, fall and spring. So we took a look at some of the uh, instructional areas like social and emotional development, which is that first bar graph, literacy, the second one, language development, the third one, and cognition, the fourth one on the right-hand side. And what you're seeing in green are the scores that we achieved in the fall of 2019 um, DRDP. And the reason why that is interesting is that fall is one measurement, spring is another measurement. If we get our students 80% or above in the spring, we're doing really great. And so some of these measures were already reached in the fall of 2019, and we still had a semester and a half to go. What's even more interesting is the blue graph, which is our fall of 2021 results. And uh, we are already over 80% um, kindergarten readiness in a couple of different areas. And this is coming off of a year of COVID. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, we instituted um, a formative and uh, summative assessment tool called Cognitive Toy Box. And that's made a huge difference in the way our teachers are teaching and assessing. And our families are able to engage that um, child's development while they're at the, at the house prescribed to them through Cognitive Toy Box. So um, the assessment program is working, the kids are working hard, they're having fun, and uh, we're excited to see the progress as, as we move along. Um, next slide, please. Um, Board President Lockerbie will uh, recognize this picture that we were at uh, for open house. Uh, we had an amazing open house, an amazing turnout, uh, March 31st, the night before we went out on spring vacation. Uh, we had more than 200 people in attendance. Um, we had our students perform cubtastically. Uh, they did a little student performance uh, in, in our South Play Yard. Uh, our staff prepared the students to have them do some of the leading of the classroom tours and not just the teacher talking to them. And that was a, a highlight for the families because they like it when they see their students and what they're doing in their schools. This is my cubby. This is my work on the wall. This is where I play. Oh, this is where I learn to read. So it was really exciting to see that part. Um, and of course, our friends from Monrovia Reads uh, and, and, our, and the, uh, Annette Simpson was able to be there as well for our literacy presentation. Um, and we had community, other community partners uh, that were involved in, in passing out information. So all in all, it was a, it was a huge success uh, for us uh, on our open house night. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so actually, as part of the uh, open house festivities, 
we started with a universal pre-kindergarten uh, public meeting, a public presentation, to explain what universal pre-K, universal pre-kindergarten is. Uh, it's a huge state initiative. Uh, every district must have a pre-K plan. Um, and basically, the pre-K plan is what is the district going to do with the students the year before kindergarten? That is, in, in essence, what that plan is. And it affects two programs that we currently already have structure for, preschool and TK. And so I'll, I'll go through some of the information uh, that we have been working on behind the scenes, actually quite diligently. Uh, I also want to shout out <laughs> all the uh, district departments who have continue to be invited to all of these planning meetings, and they do a great job, and I love meeting with them. Uh, they're amazing uh, people. So Universal, uh, Universal Pre-Kindergarten, UPK, another acronym in education. I, I know that there's no, no shortage of acronyms, but UPK, um, we held a public engagement presentation as part of our open house activities. We had, um, we had over 80 in attendance, um, which has exceeded the exceeded the max that we had said that we were going to have, so it was really well attended. Um, Assembly Bill 130 established Universal Pre-Kindergarten as an initiative that expands the two programs, uh, Transitional Kindergarten and the State Preschool programs. Uh, UPK expands TK eligibility with universal access in three years. And there's a gradual, and I'll go over this in a second, but there's a gradual increase of four-year-olds being able to participate in TK. Um, and then it expands also the preschool programs. There's additional funds for TK. There's additional funds for preschool. Um, Ed Code uh, 8281.5 will require us, MUSD, to create a UPK, a UPK plan that's going to need to be board approved by uh, June. So we'll, we'll present this in May, and I'll talk more about that here in a second as well. Um, so next slide explains the TK eligibility. Um, so for the 2022-23 school year, um, September 2nd to February 2nd is if their fifth birthday falls between that, between those dates, then they're eligible for TK. In the, so every year there's going to be a couple more months of TK eligibility uh, for the four-year-olds. So that in 23-24, we're serving students that could be four years, seven months old, and not on their fifth birthday as it currently is now. Uh, and finally, by the time we get to 2025-26, there is universal access for all four-year-olds uh, for TK programs. So that is a huge shift uh, in the landscape of early childhood education. Uh, we will be ready for that. Uh, like I said, we are, we are planning behind the scenes now, and more of that will, will come to light as the next month uh, rolls on. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, the village before and after school programs, Again, shout out to our hardworking staff uh, from Village. They've been super flexible over the last couple of years with all the things that we are, had to do with COVID. And now we're moving into um, another program, which I'll talk about, Extended Learning Opportunities Program. Um, so they, they do a great job uh, as well. Um, next slide, please. So currently, our program overview is that we're serving 420 students at the six sites that we have the village program at. We're at both middle schools and every elementary school, except for Mayflower, uh, which is serviced by Boys and Girls Club for their, for their expanded learning programs. Um, we currently have a wait list altogether of 109 students. Um, so we have students that want to be in the program. We need more staff to service those students. That's something that we're working with uh, HR hard on to be able to service the amount of students that want to be in this program. Um, and the program will continue to grow and get better, and I'll go a little over ELOP here in, in a second. Um, next slide, please. Uh, village program components. Um, we do lots of different things in the village program. Uh, and, and by the way, I've taken um, the pictures you're seeing is from our current, one of our current enrichment programs called Arts Attack. So you're seeing the work done by the students in the village program uh, by first graders, second graders, third graders, fourth and fifth graders. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to see what they can do uh, during, during their time with the village program. But during village, we do a number of different things. Academic assistance is one of them. Um, we actually had um, 
some professional development time with paper tutoring uh, that tutor, tutored our staff on paper tutoring and how to utilize that uh, in an in intentional way in the after school arena. Um, enrichment includes things like arts attack, physical, act physical activity, a variety of clubs that are created by the sites and the, the youth at the sites. Um, we provide social emotional learning lessons, youth development, student council, and youth leadership roles. As Dr. Uh, Kaiser mentioned a couple years ago, we took a couple of students that were youth council type students up to Sacramento uh, and they made a huge impact. Um, uh, really on the landscape of expanded learning in all of California because at that time we needed funding and it was because of these two students one in the bilingual program from Monroe who spoke very eloquently about their uh, experience in, in an after-school program so uh, that kicked off some of the funding initiatives which I'll also talk about here in a second uh, and then we do wellness and physical activity. Uh, as was mentioned, three of our sites have been recognized by the state of California for being health and behaviors initiative sites. Uh, we have structured physical activity, uh, nutrition lessons. Uh, if you're ever at the middle schools, there's some uh, cooking and meals going on in the after school programs that the students really enjoy. So there's just a variety of things to keep the students uh, engaged and uh, safe and supported uh, during their time in the um, before and after school programs. Um, next slide, please. So um, I want to speak to two things uh, that are uh, near and dear to us as a program. Uh, one is affordability. Um, for this year, because of the increase in funding uh, and some of the state mandates, we were able to um, discount even further some of the fees that uh, go into running a program like Village. Uh, so we were able to offer a variety of discounts where the program is free and will continue to be free for uh, our unduplicated students, which are homeless foster youth, students that are on reduced price meals, free price meals, um, English language learner students. Um, and then beyond that, our program is very affordable. Uh, our before school program, which runs for an hour and a half before the schools start school, uh, is $7 per week. And our after school program, which runs all the way up until six o'clock, um, is $30 per week. So um, that speaks to the affordability. If anyone here has ever had to pay some childcare outside of that, um, uh, wishes they would have been spending $30 a week or $7 a week. So anyhow, um, and then accessibility has become very important um, for these programs because of the nature of the students that we serve. We need our um, students that need the program the most to be serviced the most. And so that speaks to our priorities for enrolling. Uh, homeless foster youth, free and reduced lunch students, English learners, our state mandated priorities that we want to adopt in our enrollment process. And we have and will continue to do that um, as well. Um, next slide, please. So similar to UPK, um, Expanded Learning Opportunities Program is a large state initiative that is going to have a impact on expanded learning programs uh, throughout, throughout the state of California. So it's similar in the fact that it's a state-driven initiative. It's gonna have an impact here in Monrovia. It's having an impact at all districts um, up and down the state of California. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, ELOP, that's your next acronym. Uh, so we have UPK, we have ELOP for tonight. Uh, provides funding for after school and intercession enrichment programs for TK through sixth grade students. And again, the intent is really to uh, make sure that you are serving those unduplicated students, the homeless foster youth, reduced and free price meal students, English learners. Um, so the ex access to the uh, program, the access to the program is that we're required to offer ELOP to all TK through K6, TK and K6 students uh, that are unduplicated and program access to 50% of those enrolled. So we have to be intentional on how we roll out uh, our, our, our ELOP program. Uh, we gotta make sure that we reach those students, provide them access, and then uh, we, we carry on from there. Um, Time of service for the program, <laughs> nine hours, which is combined instructional and expanded learning time. So similar to our um, early care, um, 
early care approach in that we have a lot of structure. We have a state-run preschool at CELC. Every single one of our uh, elementary schools has a TK program. We have a lot of structure in place already for expanded learning. We have expanded learning uh, sites that operate already at all of the elementaries in the two middle schools. We operate past nine hours a day uh, between school hours, before school, and after school. Um, what's going to be different is the plus 30 intercession days uh, that, we need, that we need to um, program for the students. And that's part of the planning process. And again, my friends in all the district departments are getting <laughs> invited to two sets of planning meetings now, one for UPK and one for ELLP. So, um, but we, we, are, we will um, be coming up with a plan on that, and I'll, I'll talk to that here in a second. Um, I did want to, next si slide please, um, to just show some similarities and differences between uh, what we currently have, which is funding through the, our ACES program, our After School Education Safety Grant. That's the grant that has been funding Village, and what's happening with the ELOP uh, funding mandates. And so that is what you're seeing at the top is, uh, is what ACES brings to us and what ELOP brings to us. Um, for the 21-22 school year, um, our ACES grant dollars is $861,000. Uh, that's actually a significant increase of what we've had um, over the last couple years and an increase of what we had when our two students were speaking over at uh, the state capitol. So um, the state of California continues to recognize um, the need for early education funding and expanded learning funding. Um, so on the ELOP side, uh, the funding that the district has received is a little over a million dollars. Um, right now, that is one-time funding. However, in ed code, there is some language, language that speaks to there is an intent by the legislator to keep funding um, ELOP, but it's not in writing yet. Um, so the million dollars uh, in the 861, uh, the, the, what the state wants us to do is to look at that as one uh, funding stream to be able to reach out to those students that need the access, uh, which we'll talk about through these program plans here in a second. Uh, documentation, uh, we already submit a uh, program plan upon renewal, which is due every three years uh, on the village or ACES side. Um, we will be submitting a program plan to CDE uh, that we are developing uh, that will be presented again to the board for review in, uh, in May. Um, the attendance requirement uh, is similar for both programs. Um, if the student is in school, they should be in program. Um, but there's a revised early release policy. Uh, we've, got, <laughs> we've gone through uh, the early release policy a couple of different times. I've actually, I actually sit on the uh, state's committee on early release policy, so um, I know firsthand some of the requests and asks for parents to be able to have access to the program, but to be able to be released to do the things that they need to do from the program. So with the new early release policy that was just revised uh, in December, um, there is no mandate to keep the students in the program for a certain amount of time. Um, so the caveat being that we don't want students to check in for five minutes and then leave because there may be students on the wait list that need that program. So those are the kind of conversations we'll have, but there is not a, you must stay in the program till six, or you must stay in the program till uh, for three hours until five o'clock or early. So our early release um, policy has just gotten a lot more, a lot simpler, to be, to be honest. Um, so um, next slide, please. So our plans for ELLP, um, again, we're having ongoing meetings, um, and we are going to look at, as the state recommends, to blend or braid uh, ACES with ELOP uh, to provide one single comprehensive extended learning program, which has been suggested by CDE. Um, we're looking at developing um, a priority registration, targeting and reaching out to those unduplicated students, which, which uh, um, Dana Smith has been instrumental in helping us to identify and, uh, and giving access to the program to those students, followed up by access to all. Uh, based on those registration priorities. Um, so we're looking at a mid-May um, priority registration. Uh, we've gone through this a couple of times during uh, COVID with some 
particular needs for registration and priorities through uh, pods, hybrid pods. So our system, uh, Easy Child Track, is definitely going to be able to handle um, this this registration priority for um, extended learning programs. Um, we'll continue to work through the planning process for both uh, ELLP and UPK. Uh, that is ongoing. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Um, next steps for both Universal Pre-Kindergarten and Extended Learning Opportunities Program. Uh, April 19th, um, we're going to have our first uh, UPK Parent Subcommittee meeting. At our parent engagement meeting at CELC, we invited uh, parents to become a part of this uh, subcommittee, and I've put out messaging on Parent Square for uh, anyone interested in being a part of this subcommittee. We'll, we'll, we'll send out some more information for this as well but we're going to have a parent subcommittee because that's a group that we want to hear from as we as we plan um, UPK and ELLP planning meetings are ongoing uh, we have the priority registration for ELLP we're targeting mid-May um, to launch that and then uh, to present both the UPK plan and the ELLP plan which is being created uh, to the board for for review on at the May 25th uh, board meeting so lots going on uh, behind, behind the scenes with lots of different people whom I appreciate all of them, for sure. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. McFadden and Dr. Kaiser. Are there any questions? Anderson? Thank you so much. Um, I want to direct your attention back to the CELC program, um, the graphs with the green and the uh -huh. blue. Um, I, I wanted to, to commend you on this incredible growth um, and also to um, share my appreciation for this kind of feedback because this is the kind of really data-driven feedback I was looking for several months ago when I said, if we have programs, I want to know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And clearly this one has, has made quite an impact for you. So thank you for bringing it to our attention and well done in implementing um, the cognitive toolbox tool because obviously there's been substantial growth in um, your, your students. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Devante? Thank you, President Lockerbie. Can you hear me? Um, thank you for the presentation tonight. I, I just want to ask of uh, the 19 students that are waitlisted for the CELSI program, mm -hmm. how long have they been on that list and have we considered an opening another class or is it a capacity issue? Uh, so some of those, all, those students don't all have a, a singular wait list time. It depends on when they enroll. So some are recent, some have been on there uh, for a little bit. Um, some of it is a capacity issue if they're trying to enroll in the morning p uh, in the morning part-time class. Those classes are full, but we have room in the afternoon, so that's what we offer them. Most of those 19 students would like to be in the full-day class. Uh, and we currently have the one full-day class. And so that, again, is part of the conversation that we need to have um, in UPK planning is do we consider staffing another full-day class? I mean, that, that is part of the conversation. So um, most of the students that... Um, are part of that wait list, uh, uh, participate in the in the AM program or the PM program, but they want they're wait listed for the for, for the for their class. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just real quick, thanks, Tom. Uh -huh. um, three quick things: age for admittance, cost to attend, and where do we advertise it? <laughs> so age for admittance for uh, preschool, right? Mm -hmm. um, so age for admittance right now is three years old. Um, that could be sliding down as well. So um, TK has slid down, obviously, over the next three years. There is discussion about earlier eligibility for preschool. It hasn't happened yet. So three years old for preschool. Um, that was the first question. I know you asked about cost, cost to attend. <laughs> cost to attend. This is a state-run preschool, so there is no cost if the family qualifies based on the state's um, income ceilings. Um, if a family is over that income ceiling based on household size and income, uh, there is some families that are tuition-based families, and that is $560 or so a month, uh, $5,000 plus for the year. 
And where do we advertise it? Um, so we are having a very strong <coughs> presence, and we will continue to um, advertise and market these programs. Um, uh, our um, initial reach out has been through uh, Parent Square. We are <laughs> we've already ordered uh, a, a whole bunch of um, enrollment uh, materials that's going to go up to the schools as soon as we get them. Uh, we'll have a presence at uh, Monrovia Days Parade. Um, there's other thoughts about how we can um, advertise in the community, and that's being explored. Uh, our our uh, friend Gustavo has been uh, really uh, good about sending out the messaging too. So we just need to continue um, to look at ways and create and be creative with our advertising efforts. Um, there's some things that we were discussing in terms of advertising <coughs> through the city. So those are, those are also be part of that UPK plan. Might I suggest, because your competitors are advertising in front of their buildings, mm -hmm. that we should advertise in all of front of all of our buildings? Um, I think we have a pretty significant footprint in the city, and um, anybody who considers sending their children to anywhere should get us consideration first. I, I agree, and that's part of the materials that we are waiting to get uh, print, print shop finalized. So that, that's on its way, actually. But yes, Thank we, you. we agree with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to um, tag on to uh, Mr. Hammond's question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of age to enroll, isn't there a potty trained So yeah, well, it's three years old plus being potty trained. So you have to be potty trained. Correct. To, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that, I, so I, that's it should have been a more uncomfortable um, <laughs> discussion, but right. for me it wasn't. <laughs> Clearly, we've <laughs> talked about this before, um, but I, I will say that um, for our special education students, however, um, if they're three years old or five years or five, we will service those students whether they're potty trained or not. So I, I, I need to make you all aware of that. But yes, to, for the Gen Ed that full day program, they need to be three years old and or and uh, potty trained. Just to follow up on that, mm -hmm. um, let's say a child isn't quite ready to be potty trained in September, but by November they are there. So can they, um, space permitting, join it at any time? Correct. Or? That's okay. a good. The, that's a good question. We take ongoing enrollments as well as with age. So they mm -hmm. don't they don't have to be three by September first. Correct. But they can. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. You. That is that is one hundred percent correct. I have just a few comments because Ms. Trevanti asked the question that I was going to ask. Um, just a few true stories. Mm -hmm. um, at CELC Open House, um, had several of your Cubsters come up to me <laughs> with their new books from uh, Monrovia Reads and insisted that I read to them. And I did because, uh, and I tried to skip pages and that was not allowed. Um, I'm sharing that story because they were so excited about the books mm -hmm. and just wanted to share with anyone and they, um, the, 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 so many kids that were so gregarious. It was just really wonderful to see. They were so comfortable there. Their parents were so comfortable there. They were so excited about reading. I also had a similar experience with um, kids when I went into the classrooms. And they didn't know who I was, but they said, you come here and see where my cubby is. <laughs> Look at, this is my pile of glitter right here. <laughs> um, so it, it was it was palpable. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting to see. And I, I really appreciate being able to see that and, and being able to see the growth. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was good back then. It's good now. It, it continues to get better. It's very impressive. And the other true story I wanted to share is um, at a community event recently that I attended, um, also attended by Christy Lopez, mm -hmm. Senator Portentino's field representative, who pulled me aside and told me that the reason that um, CELC ACES was able to get the funding increases that they got were because of you, mm -hmm. because um, of how passionate you were, how communicate, communicative you were, um, and how thorough your information and um, your passion. So I wanted to share that with everybody and extend my thanks for that because it's, it's a game changer for parents, and I, I know this from experience. <laughs> being part of CELC and being part of the Village program is a game changer. It allows people to go to work 
Um, so um, I'm really appreciative at how well you have and how much you have expanded that program. So thank you. Thank, thank you both you, very thank much. Thank you, Board President. That is really cubtastic of you to say. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so, and I'm just a reflection of the amazing staff, students, and parents that we have. So uh, their passion fuels me on a daily basis. If you all are, if anybody here is ever feeling bad about whatever, come over to CELC and just walk around with these kids, and you will be put with some energy for sure. Yeah, you may have to read, correct, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you both very much for your presentations. Mm -hmm. And now we are going to move on to the next item, which is the update from Amigos de los Rios. And we have Ms. Smith, who is going to introduce Amigos. Good evening, Board President Lockerbie, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, Cabinet, and members of the community. We have an amazing partnership with Amigos de los Rios and here tonight with us is Claire Robinson to provide an update to the board on the projects at Plymouth and Monrovia High School. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, thank you for helping me with the PowerPoint. Um, it's wonderful to see you, Superintendent, Board President, Board members, Cabinet members, school community, yay! Um, happy spring break. Um, I'm still on spring break right now, so um, could we have the first slide? So, yeah, so I know we all kind of know uh, who Amigos is, but just because every time we get a chance to do a project together, more ideas and hopes and dreams about partnership come up. So just kind of reminding us that we are a 501c3 focused on our Emerald Necklace vision for a sustainable metro area and really looking at greening streets, parks, trails, and schools, and we're delighted to be partnering um, with Monrovia Uni Unified on a number of projects. Um, so I've shared this before, but there's a lot of research nationally about the various benefits of greening, and they in include physical fitness, physical wellness, just expanding the recreation opportunities by adding these nature-based elements and tree canopy for heat reduction, mental wellness, and I think I know on a personal basis as a mom of a 16-year-old cumulative impact of the pandemic proportional to years on earth is definitely on the rise. Like there's definitely a lot of mental health and anxiety that students are facing and we understand that these environments are, are part of helping mitigate some of that anxiety. And then academic performance, it's you know easier to focus on math and connect if you feel less anxious and if you've had the benefit of walking through a green area or seeing a little butterfly or connecting to nature. So we're excited about the grants update. Um, we have to be very patient all the time. We, our staff is, we mentor recent college graduates and teach them how to write government grants. We don't get them all. We have to rewrite and model leadership of persistence and tenacity. So we did, um, we're closing out our Cal Fire and Forestry grant um, at Santa Fe Middle School, and we're opening up our uh, second phase of work at Plymouth. Um, so glad to be partnering with Dr. Drew. I've never seen you without a mask. I'm a little shocked. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're very excited that the grant, the successful grant, has now become a contract. And I know that sounds a little odd, like, it doesn't always happen. You know, you've got to go through all the different steps and uh, CEQA and all the back and forth with a state analyst. So we are, yes, ready to go. And we are working with um, uh, Dana, Dana Smith and Anthony Parada and the school administration to make sure that the second the students are gone, boom, we're there to do the big, uh, the big work at Plymouth um, and in the street in the front of the school. And then also, the only contract we don't have yet, which is in theory within the next 72 hours, is the Coastal Conservancy. And that's taken quite a long time to have that grant become a contract. One of the things that they added is a diversity, equity, inclusion clause that required that the Garbilino Quiche, our local uh, tribe, have a monitor present when we dig the rain gardens in front of the Monrovia High School. 
so we had to add on an additional fund for that um, but we have that contract in place now if you could go to the next one so so yes phase one at Plymouth we've had a lot of fun doing learned a lot together and we have some adaptive management um, areas to address in the back you know adding some more of the pervious concrete and being able to host ever more activities under the trees and recent windstorm required some tree doctors on site because we had some impact to the legacy trees there and during the spring break we worked on some <laughs> tree trimming and um, helping with those trees but the big issue is the stormwater project um, and I know that um, you could if you could next yeah thanks um, we have our stormwater garden in the front but the the big issue um, looking at if you could go to the next slide um, sorry next slide I, I'm, I apologize um, so I, I think this is just a, an image of the kindergarten with the rainwater garden in there um, but we need to address major rainwater coming from the fabric of the city from the north if you could go to the next um, and I know we've seen this plan before in November of 2020 but now we have the funding to take out a good bit of the parking lot and create infiltration in that area that um, will literally receive and capture the water that's coming from Rochelle, Jeffrey's um, tree lane. And we're working with the city of Monrovia on the permit to take out the, the street, half the street that's against the curb. And um, if you could keep going. We're right now, um, I'm just showing some images of what is the phase one and in operation. Um, but we're, we're working with our engineer to um, expand the same vocabulary that we already have of the pervious concrete and the boulders and the native plants and um, really address the, the flooding issue. If you could keep going, that'd be great. So you all kind of now have come and celebrated with us. Many of you have helped us plant at some of these schools. Um, we're going to continue with that work, but add some infrastructure elements that are pretty um, cons considerable. Next, yeah, thanks. And uh, to offset the lack of storm drain infrastructure in the larger neighborhood that we've already discussed. And notably, go to the next one, um, the small rain gardens and bioswales around have done uh, some wonderful work in transforming the feeling of the school and helping with the vector issues. But the next phase is really a large scale removal of the pavement and creating the infiltration galleries um, to prevent flooding. Next, um, improve the drainage, um, manage stormwater, protect water quality, and control the vectors for, for mosquitoes. Um, but there's also a lot of other benefits that, that we know and we're learning every day more about in terms of air quality, habitat, biodiversity protection, and creating COVID safe spaces. I had my mask on because my daughter went to bring her daughter to see some, not my, sorry, my sister went to bring her daughter to see some colleges on the East Coast and came back with COVID. I haven't seen her for a couple of weeks, but it's still around and it may resurge and there might ev evolve. So that I think the outdoor spaces that are shaded and configured so that pedagogy can take place outdoors is a positive thing moving forward. So this is when I finally believed that um, that there was a flooding problem. Um, and uh, so our proposal is to, working with the engineers of the city and our engineers, if you could go to the next slide, is um, where, where that turquoise is to remove all of that pavement and redo it with a pervious with infiltration gallery. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, you can see the current configuration of the tree lane that comes from Jeffries and then goes Bowley and then up La Rochelle, so you have that kind of apron. And we only have the two directions, the two lanes, so we wanted to uh, cut into the front of the school and add about nine feet, so push the sidewalk back nine feet, which would be the equivalent of one lane, and regrade so that when students are dropped off in the drop-off lane, the water is away from their car, and when they step in onto the pavement, um, there'll be a better welcome and their parents will, there's room for about 10 cars, so it will just help with the circulation in that area. 
Um, so that's what we're doing the engineering drawings for at this point. I know that's a little hard to see, I'm sorry. Um, and did you want to add any questions or comments or Dr. Giroux? Okay. okay, great. So we're working hard to sort of do a day-by-day -day schedule for the minute students are gone to the minute teachers are back and make sure that we can choreograph starting and finishing the work. And we've also been exploring um, opportunities to maybe get a bus drop off on our, in the Arcadia property to the south that you can access through Longton. Um, now that we've built the ADA path around the field, where I know that's really hard to get in where the um, Arcadia uh, softball field and there's a driveway and a fire lane on the west side of the campus, but it's very hard to do a K-turn and get back. We're just really brainstorming how to improve the entrance and exit and circulation because even what we do will you know, really deal with the, the drainage problems, but there's always a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a knot of, of traffic there. So if anyone has any great relationships with the city of Arcadia, some of the students are obviously from Arcadia, it would be wonderful to activate those. Um, so um, that's the update on the um, phase two for um, Plymouth. And we'll, we, we receive funding from state uh, natural resources agency and also from the um, water, safe clean water program of the county. And they have requested that we do a ribbon cutting sometime. They didn't tell us when, but um, this is one of the first projects to move into implementation. Um, so they'd like to schedule a ribbon cutting in the next couple of months. And then we have a ribbon um, celebration on the 23rd of uh, April at 9 o'clock at Santa Fe. And I mean, every time we go there to do a, a watershed steward event, it's a celebration and we're having fun and replanting and weeding and caring for the site. But um, this is special because we're, we've invited the head of the Conservancy, um, who's been to the school before, but just as a, as a note to celebrate. And then for the Monrovia High School um, Watershed Discovery Project, that has been longstanding with the California, the Coastal Conservancy. And we continue to be very inspired by the fact that the agency that focuses on the ocean and ocean health is working so far up watershed to make sure that all of us realize our impact on the greater ocean with a little piece of paper or if you have a dog and you don't pick up after, like that all ends up in the ocean. So we're excited to start that. And um, last, last time I was here, we, we talked about, we could go, go for the incredible, incredible power and beauty of the Monrovia High School historic structure and some of the research we've been doing with our historic preservation consultants and um, using the similar DNA of the plant palette and vocabulary elements of rain gardens and berms. Um, so as soon as that grant comes in, which I hope is next week, we can do our next phase of diligence with getting our surveys done. Um, we, we don't have existing condition topography and utilities, so we'll be doing that on the front of the school. And coming back to you, I'll, I'll work with cabinet members to be invited back in June or July to show you a final planting plan for the high school. And then um, apart from that, um, I wanted to invite us to consider having Monrovia Unified become an Emerald Necklace Coalition member. And that's uh, based on the Emerald Necklace Accord that we wrote in 2000, I think it was five. So I'll share that. And it talks about water resources, protection of precious water resources, education for students and environmental issues, and um, basically uh, the, the importance of, of care of the environment. Um, I know that some of the principals have mentioned that we've been working with California Green Ribbon School. What is that and how could we aspire to becoming, having some of the sites become the Green Ribbon Schools? So I'd be glad to sh share more about that in another presentation. And then I'm really moved by the career pathways, like urban forestry. I didn't know about it when I was a teenager. Um, I studied architecture and urban planning, but there's some incredible sustainable design pathways. And um, I was looking at the, uh, some of the charts and modules that are available at Santa Fe in the computer room. 
and some of those touch on what we're doing. We hired a couple of people from the high school last year to take care of Santa Fe. So we're, we hire uh, interns during the summer um, to take care of the, the, the places that we have transformed. So it would be wonderful to explore some career pathways um, through this work because it's not just doing a landscape project, it's really working together, learning. It's, it's a learning laboratory when we do this work um, and we really encourage connection with teachers and um, the families. So the other thing that um, I think would be really interesting and we're looking for funding for this is a new type of um, scope of work between a teacher's aide, a sustainable landscape care team person and an outdoor educator, uh, like you might have in a national park when you go through the booth. And if no one's coming through the booth, then they're you know, pruning the area around the booth. Um, they, the, the folks in the National Park Service can talk about a bird, or they can talk about nature, or they can do work, um, and they can also provide a safety presence and a security mm -hmm. presence. So we're, the sites that we've already worked on in multiple school districts, we're thinking about what kind of a staff person would, would be good to, to play some of those same roles. And those are just thoughts that I wanted to share, and I continue to be very deeply committed to the Morovia um, and you all and all your incredible, incre I want to cry, all the principals are off the charts and the students are incredible. So um, we're here to continue to serve and learn together. And the last slide was just, oops, sorry, just uh, um, what doc Dr. Um, well, Santa Fe, basically in the computer lab, I just put a, a red square around some of the things that we're doing actively that I thought it would be fun if students do takeoff measurements or they're studying um, different parts of uh, what does it take to look at a campus in terms of the graphic design and the reconnaissance and be actively engaged and be able to put that on their resume as something that they live through. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do we have questions or comments? Thank you so much. Um, in, in particular, I know that the, the Plymouth um, work is going to take a sub substantial amount of time. Do we know what kind of time frame that will um, include and will be, we be able to get it done before the next rainy season? Right, yes, um, that's our intention. Okay. Um, so the, when school closes, we, I met with some of our contractors today and we're continuing to work with the same ones we did phase one on and trying to like really book them because mm -hmm. the prices are going up for contracts and the availability is going down. So I'm kind of terrified. So I want to make sure that everybody's ready the minute we get the go ahead and we're working closely. And, you know, I'm sorry that there can't be summer school at the campus, but we really can't, um, you know, mix construction with students. So that is our intention to do the hardscape work. Now, there's always, in the front of the school, we're going to be doing additional planting. That won't be done during I'm the I'm not summer. worried about that. I'm worried yeah. about the foot deep of, yeah. of water that yeah. runs off every year. Yeah, that is, it is our intention to complete that this summer in the very small window that we have. Okay. And that will limit the impact on um, our families because school won't be in session during that right. time. Right, okay. exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Exactly. Hi. Um, well, I know we talked at length about the uh, water in front of Plymouth. Would you, it's been solved, right? Right. <laughs> I had concerns about water congregating against footings of buildings. Right. And those, are, those concerns have been addressed. I have not seen the final plan. Right. We are working with our engineer right now, and we have the setbacks required um, from footings. So there's like a triangular shape depending on the thickness and the depth of the footing. So we are 100% out of the, we're in a cleared area. Okay. And, and so I understand, because I, 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 I need to see it. The water that's currently on the street is going to go where? Well, two places. First of all, it kind of comes down Tree Lane and Rochelle and bumps up against the curb of uh, Bowley. And right now that's graded to let the water kind of convex hit the curb. So when we take that convex and the county owns the north part of the street, the city owns the south, 
and we cut nine feet in and move the sidewalk back. Um, we're going to regrade so that there's a crease so that when you pull up, the water will go into that pervious crease, like a V-shaped crease. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out of your car, you'll be stepping you know, up. So part of the water is going to go into the roughly 15 feet wide um, by 200 long pervious it's going to be a replacement of the existing asphalt and it will if you multiply that it's a basically the engineers have told us you need 26,000 cubic feet of capacity so a, approximately 24 inches by that surface area will be captured there and then it turns the corner on the east side of the site where the current parking lot is where the current there's ADA parking and there's a, a a home that is just you know without really definition there's just some pavement in the ground so then there's a the gate to the school the ADA parkings in the front so that ADA parking will also be part of the infiltration but we have to stay uh, away from the party wall that, that separates the school property from the adjacent multifamily homes so we'll be more in the middle of the parking lot cutting a channel out and routing the water into that area so it'll be away from the footing of the cafeteria and the buildings that are you know on that um, east side and enough square footage that the water will be infiltrated and if anything still gets through it'll go into the bioswale that we are already made this past phase that runs adjacent to the south edge of the parking lot that kind of comes in on an l shape and runs east west and we've had a couple of pretty big rains, <laughs> which has been awesome to see how much water is coming. And that bioswale, which is a linear, curvilinear bioswale with a dish at the end of it, at the, on the extreme east end of the site, is taking a lot of the water, but, but we know where it isn't taking it. So all those things added together means that the water within a 24-hour period will, will be received and recede. Okay. And the last question, um, at, well, actually a comment and then a question. So at no, if I understand, at no time are we putting water in any pipe. It's going to be daylighted the whole way through. Yeah, well, there's no pipe to connect to. Um, right, well, there's no sewer to get there's to. It's, no, yeah, there's it's impossible. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, but we're not putting water in a pipe and directing it to some other place and then daylighting it 100 feet away. No, un unfortunately, we, we are kind of in the middle of an area that isn't served. Like the, the first storm drain that we can get to is a couple miles away. So we're basically capturing and infiltrating everything on site. Okay. Because this is, so the capacity of the water that's being, it's being built for, is it being built for a 25-year storm, a 50-year storm, or a 100-year storm? 10. Wow. So it's not very much at all. Well, the kind of curve of 24 hours, like the one, one design load is 24 hours because in a 24 hour period, you know, if you have a really big rain, you get water flooding and, you know, causing a nuisance. The next load is a five year load. The next load is a 10 year load. So we've, we are designing to the 10 year load. Um, if there's a 50 or a hundred year storm, there'll still be a flood at the site, but it, I don't know with climate change how much more frequently we'll get a 50 or 100 year storm, but if there's that storm, people aren't going to be outside likely. Um, so it's it's not the people that well I'm always, we're always concerned about people, but it's what it does to the buildings is what it because if you can cause repre it'll uh, go to the field. You can, you, thank you, irreparable damage with water that is really expensive. Right. Um, and you won't know about it today. You're going to find out about it probably three or four years after the fact, and it's going to be really bad and really expensive. So, so my, yeah. my, my question is then, if we're building to a 10-year a ten year storm, well, you would get a 10-year 10 10 year storm quite frequently. And, I mean, the volume of water that, that comes, particularly there, it, it, Water loves gravity, That's, and everything is downhill from those streets as it's trying to get south. I mean, if you removed all the properties and all the improvements, all that water would just keep heading south until it finally hit something else in Long Beach, eventually. Mm -hmm. we're, we're redirecting it. 
And I want to be very careful and mindful. I'm, I'm not here trying to suggest that we build to 100 year, but I'm not so sure that a 10 year is, is sufficient. And I just want to go yeah. on record because yeah. I don't think it's sufficient. Okay. So that 20 years from now, when someone's ripping a thing up going, it wasn't sufficient, there was somebody said, I don't think building to 10 years is sufficient. And I know we're limited to the amount of money that we have, but I am deeply concerned that we are not building it correct. It may yeah. divert the water for a while, but I don't know if this is a solution. And that's what I'm saying. Well, thank you. It's, it's always critical to be looking at scenarios and worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. Well, so. a worst case scenario is a hundred year storm and then you're yeah. really in big trouble. But I think a 10 year storm is short sighted. Well, one thing that reassures me is that we're not bringing water closer to any of the structures. Right now, if there were a hundred year storm, the whole field would flood. You know, it, it does flood now to a certain extent, but the water is the way it comes for gravity and the hardscape. It hits the front of the building, uh, the curb, I'm sorry, not the building, and then comes around the parking lot and then down turns again and into the field. So in a hundred year storm, the good news is that field would be flooded, but the school, buildings are not going to be flooded and we're not changing that balance we're just trying to in a in a 24-hour event five-year 10-year event infiltrate it on site so that the field would be ready to use quicker and that the street would clear quicker but um i i, I honestly don't think we're going to cause any damage to the adjacent property um you know that's that's behind that party wall or to the buildings on the school campus the field is where the water goes. And, and this is for the board to consider, and I'm not advocating changing anybody's mind or trying to change a mind at this late date. The issue is the water that's, that comes from the street and then comes to us, we have plausible deniability for damage because it wasn't our fault. The minute we start altering this, and we do, and then the county is gonna get involved, the city is gonna be involved, and they're going to say that, you know, we helped mitigate the problem. Now, MUSD, it's your problem because this is squarely going into our property. We don't create the water. We didn't create the flow until we put a shovel in the ground. Then we caused it. Just so we all know. Forewarned being forearmed. You will have two other agencies in this land going, whoop, not my problem. Not mine. You guys dug it up. You guys did this. It's yours, just so we know. We will have fingers pointing right at us. Any other questions or comments? So, Rob, I'm, I'm curious, what aspect of, let's say, the 100-year storm, are you, are you worried about the, if, the if you, field? If, if, or, a 100-year storm is a, a cataclysmic okay, event. It is. Everything's going. Right. It, it, it's, it's, you, you, you actually can't build for it. It's so kind of messed up. Let's look at the 20 or the 50 then, because I think you mentioned those. Well, I think if you built, I think 10 is short-sighted. We had an event just about two weeks ago here that dumped a boatload of water that created pretty significant amount of, um, oh, we were at the high school today. See all the water damage that was there. That was one event, one day, and we had damage, okay? If you would have compounded that by two, three, four days of the same amount of rain, mm -hmm. which you would have exponentially more damage because mm -hmm. it's trying to get that water away from it. On a t When you're preparing for a 10-year, and okay, I'm not an engineer and I don't play one on TV, but I've done this before. If you do not build for a significant amount of water to get moved, what will happen is either through percolation or something else, which is what we're relying on here is percolation. So once the ground becomes saturated, it has nowhere to go. So then it rises. And once it rises, it has to go someplace else. Right. And it will keep moving south. And it will go towards our buildings. And it'll start doing things. And you're right. It'll flood the, it'll probably flood the, 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 field. the baseball fields. and. All that area south that belongs to the city of Arcadia down there by the church, it'll flood all that. Mm -hmm. What I want to make sure is it stays away from the buildings. As long as it eventually will percolate into the ground, we're fine. But if it percolates in the ground next to one of our buildings, we have a significant repair job. So, so 
just so I'm clear, your concern isn't that it's going to the field, it's that it's not going to the field quickly enough. I want to make sure it stays a heck away from our buildings and everybody else's that will come to us and say, hey, sure. your water did this. That okay. makes sense. That's what I want. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And I'll share this with the engineering team and the city of Monrovia again. The building is on a little bit of a plinth because the site drops, the parking lot drops a bit. So to get up to the um, outdoor, the old outdoor cafeteria area is a couple a couple of feet. And so things are in the in a positive direction, you know, in terms of the, the way that the parking lot goes and the, even the buildings that are facing the field are up higher, the, the asphalt slopes down toward the field. So the fact that below the field is the Arcadia softball field, so that's not a catastrophic, you know, if the water, if it's a 50 or 100 year event, you know, the water will keep going south. And like you said, the Arcadia property with the uh, circular water tank and the asphalt there, it would keep going. I mean, it, worst case. So the good news is we're not in the path of anyone's home or we're not you know, putting the water close enough to any of the footings that there'll be an issue. But I've definitely heard you and I will go back to the team and repeat the, Thank you. the uh, concerns. Other questions or comments? I have some questions. Um, so when you were saying, and Mr. Hammond was, um, was asking questions, you were talking about this area, uh, the water infiltrating. Yes. Infiltrating into the ground. Right. Is that correct? So right. there's not a container, a capturing mechanism well, beneath the ground? There, there is. It's um, when we take the top sort of crust of the asphalt off and we create, based on the engineering, a volume underground. And there are different things on the market, and we've been using these boxes called Atlantis and Rainwater Harvest, and they look like a milk carton, mm -hmm. and you put them together with a rubber mallet. They're loaded for a fire truck you know, to, to weight bear if you install them correctly, and you can basically use them as a Lego block. You, know, you can go, uh, you can put rows of them, you put a filter fabric in the hole, and you line the hole with gravel and sand, mm -hmm. And then this becomes an aquifer okay. you know, that you can drive over. So the water will go from a five or 10 year event, will disappear quickly into that. Okay. And then it will, it will further infiltrate into, the, into ground the ground water. So it goes into an aquifer, beneath the aquifer is the ground. Right. And then you had mentioned, and I just want to make sure I got the location correct, um, that parking structure on Plymouth, the parking lot in Plymouth, you're talking about making that um, pervious pavement? Right, it'll be, um, should we look at the slide again? Um, it will It will be the half of Bowley Street because the north, it's kind of like convex, so right. here's the north part of Bowley and here's where the school is. Right. So the street profile is like that. Right. So we'll take the middle mm -hmm. and then cut that out and then add another lane. So right. we create a little crease. So right. all of that will be pervious, right. below which so it's on the feet. street that will be pervious, yeah. not in the parking lot that will be pervious. And secondly, okay. we'll turn the corner. Okay. And so basically the path of the channel mm -hmm. that you are directing the water, the channel and the pavement around it will be pervious. Right. Into and the aquifer. And there'll be infiltration capacity that will be invisible, but we'll have a sign to share with the students what's there. Um, and we've done this for years, at, at, and it is it is scary the first time you do it, and we we did get too close to a factory along the river in Almonte, and understood how important it is to have the setback. Um, it's a very serious issue to set back correctly so that you're not putting water up against a foundation. Um, so we're using those same equations as it were to do that. So the water right now it turns diagonally and the uh, ADA parking, it kind of goes through that and then through the gate um, and then down into the parking lot and then floods that area and goes into the field. So it won't be the entire parking lot that will be pervious pavement, right? but there will be the, 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 the path okay. that you are directing the water will be pervious so that it right. not only directs the water away, sorry, mm -hmm. not only directs the water away, but also into the aquifer and into the ground. Exactly. So you have multiple 
ways of moving the water. Right. We're really using what the water's been doing for decades already, and we're watching that. And we've had, because of phase one, we've had a lot of quality time on site. And I think you've seen us out there, Dr. Drew, when it rains, we're out there watching it and like making sure we understand the flow and the patterns. So that's been really great empirically. So we're just making a digger furrow along those same paths. We're not changing the way it would happen. So that's why the flood in the field would happen again if there's a 100-year event. Well, I understand. Thank you very much. And con congratulations, Dr. Dro. I know what a big deal it is um, to get that big, giant puddle in front of the school taken, taken care of. And thank you so much, um, Ms. Robinson, for um, helping make that happen because it's been a, a big deal for a very long time. Um, I have another question. Sure. Ms. Huff, would you mind going to the slide of Monrovia High School streetscape planting? That, yep, oh, yes, right. that one. So I see in the diagram the trees that are along Colorado mm. and also that go up on the east and west ends of the front of the school. So, and I don't think in the legend they are um, annotated. So my question is, and if you don't know at this time, that's fine, you can let us know later. Who's planting those trees? I'm wondering if there is a relationship with the city, with our city, in regards to these trees. If, if we do, if we don't, What's right. what's going on with those yeah. trees, and and whose property are they going on? Are they going on um, the the school property or in the city property? Well, that's a very important question because every project we do involves a mosaic and interjurisdictional collaboration for sure. I forget the name of the street that's to the west. To the west is Madison. 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 Thank, you. Madison. Thank you. So the city has already planted some right. of those trees. And they are committed to continue to plant, you know, because they took out so many big trees on Colorado right. when they did the right. sidewalk expansion. So they are committed to planting. And every time we write a grant, there's a considerable match required. So the match in this case is partially coming from the city of Monrovia for the tree planting. And it would be wonderful if we can work out with them. And I know it's, it's not easy at all, but some sort of ongoing care, you know, if they're considered street trees then the street trees are cared for in a manner you know throughout the whole city um, so we should continue to advocate for that the trees that are uh, perpendicular to colorado that line the parking lot mm -hmm. are more on those the are on school our property obvious, obviously but all the trees along the edges you know it's our goal to collaborate with the city of monrovia in selecting and they would actually be planting those particular trees okay so along colorado the legend of those trees that are on Colorado, to your understanding, are going to be planted by the city. Right. What is the communication about that relationship? Because I have either forgotten what, <laughs> what we had said that we would do with the city about these trees or didn't know. And I know that the community misses the shade yeah. along there and we're doing something and the city's doing something so what's the communication what's the timeline expectation because this timeline for the work that you're doing at the high school it, it it's further out mm -hmm. than I think any of us had hoped and we understand yeah. why I understand why but it's it's been a very long time yes. and we all understand why but can we get these trees can these trees be installed before we start our work so i i, I just threw a lot of questions uh, in that yeah. question so yeah. what's the communication what's mm -hmm. the expected timeline what's the um expected relationship between the city and the school district? right no thank you for asking those questions um because sometimes when you're in the limbo period between you got the grant it's so exciting but then Where's the contract? How do we move forward without the funding required to survey and all that? So uh, we've been in fairly constant communication with the city of Monrovia Public Works, Alex Tajiki okay. and Dylan Fike. And um, 
I remember the prior uh, city manager, I think it was Oscar Chi, Oliver, Oliver Chi, sorry, um, talking about the collaboration and trying, because this is in effect a public space, you know, it's used by public like, on the weekends. And so the more that, you know, if we could sit down with or whatever the right group of people are with the city and um, check in with them on whether they're not only willing to plant the trees, which is a commitment that they've made for the grant, as a match but for this grant yeah okay yeah that's part of the grant match that they plant those trees but could they further could there be an MOU um, for them to care for those trees and I would be um, happy to to go to that meeting and advocate for that um, but I think an MOU needs to be created with them I think first we would um, meeting set up a meeting Okay, I. It's something we can work with Claire and pursue with the city. Okay, thank you. Those are my only questions, except thank you so much for coming. I, I know um, the high school's been a long time in the works, um, waiting, um, but it's been absolutely amazing to see the transformations at, um, at uh, Plymouth and at Santa Fe. Uh, have you been at at Santa Fe? Yes, yes. that that is. Yeah. Huge. Just wanted to make and sure I spoke correctly. Yeah. Um, we were just looking at the picture of the rocks at Plymouth that look out mm -hmm. onto the mountains yeah. through the field, and um, Dr. Smith said we're really lucky. We, it's it's beautiful. Thank you so much for the work and the involvement. Such, such a beautiful setting. You know, the it schools really are just amazing where they're set. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks um, for your patience, and we are excited to get that contract going, and once those trees are going in, it'll feel so good in front of the high school. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Wonderful update. Thank you very much. We're moving on to consent agenda. Routine items of business placed on the consent agenda have been carefully screened by members of the staff and will be acted upon by the board with one motion. Do I hear a motion to approve? These so, so moved. Second. Any questions <clears throat> or comments? Uh, would you please call the vote, Ms. Huff? Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to action items. Starting with business services. Facility use agreement with the Los Angeles County Registrar Recorder. County Clerk, Ms. Smith. Good evening. The Board of Education is requested to approve a facility use agreement with the LA County Register Recorder for the use of the cafeteria at the Monrovia High School for the June 7th statewide direct primary election. The registrar will be responsible for delivery setup and breakdown. There will be no use of facility charge, but the registrar will be paying for any cost for staff or custodial cost incurred or comments question good I have a oh yes mr. Bunty um, I did express my concerns with dr. Smith about using the cafeteria for the um, location uh, dr. Smith you indicated that room 210 may be available were you able to confirm whether that room was available for the registrar Ms. Smith would you like to speak to that so in confirming with um, the high school, the cafeteria is the room that they are still going to use. So room 210 is not available for use. It's not available. OK, I just have concerns with the location just because it's right in the center of campus and it's, there's no easy access. But obviously, if you did a walkthrough with the registrar and they found the facility to be adequate, ADA and parking. <laughs> parking is a problem um, for uh, for this to be a, a larger voting um, facility. But if there are no other options, then 
I guess, well, it's a mute point. Questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you for expressing your concern. Hammond. So we're going to be putting the general public right in, well, our students then won't be using the cafeteria, correct? Correct. Our students are not using the cafeteria. They are, you, say it again, please. They are not using the cafeteria. So the kids, our students, will not be using the cafeteria Correct. for that entire day. Correct. And so food service will be moved to? They have the grab and go, so they have their setup outside. Okay. And this is June 7th. School's in session. Will school be in session? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think graduation's eighth. on my birthday. Which is the 8th? Mm-hmm. Okay. So all you guys want to get a jump on that present. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Hearing a motion in a second. Any more discussion or questions? Would you please call for the vote? Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to item two, purchase agreement with Cisco Foods. Ms. Smith? The Board of Education has requested to approve a piggyback purchase agreement for the Food Service Department for the purchase of frozen food items and paper goods with Cisco Foods for the remainder of the school year and for the summer. The district currently uses Gold Star and Gold Star vendor has been having some issues filling all of our orders. So this vendor is a backup vendor in the event that we need to reach out for items. We have a backup. Any questions or comments? I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion in a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Huff, will you please call the vote? Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to Human Resources item number three, approval of updated job description, Director of Performing Arts, Dr. Francois. Good evening, President Lockerbie, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Cabinet, and guests. The Board of Education is requested to approve the updated job description for Director of Performing Arts. Since being last updated in 2014, under the direction of the Deputy Superintendent, the Director of Performing Arts provides leadership and program management in the implementation of a TK-12 instructional program in dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts based on the district's long-range plan for arts education. Wonderful, thank you. Any questions or comments? Entertain a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? Ms. Huff, will you please ask for the votes? Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to item four, resolution recognizing April 24th through 30 through 30th as Administrative Professionals Week and April 27th as Administrative Professionals Day. Dr. Francois. The Board of Education is requested to adopt resolution number 2122-21 recognizing April 24th through 30th, 2022 as Administrative Professionals Week and Wednesday, April 27th, 2022 as Administrative Professionals Day. Any questions or comments? Entertain a motion. So move. Good. Second. <laughs> Hearing a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Huff, would you please call the vote? Board Member Hammonds? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Trevanti? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Moving on to board business. Resolution ordering regular biennial governing board member election, Dr. Smith. 
Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Board of Education is requested to adopt resolution number 2122-22, ordering a regular biennial governing board member election on Tuesday, November 8th, 2022, pursuant to Education Code 5000. Elections will be held on November 8th, 2022, to elect members to governing boards in most of the school and community college districts in Los Angeles County. Governing boards of districts scheduled to hold elections on this date are required to take action to initiate the regular biennial governing board election by adopting a resolution ordering an election. The adopted resolution must be returned to the Los Angeles County of Office of Education no later than the end of this month, April 2022. Questions or comments? Entertain a motion. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Vonti. Um, yes, President Lockerbie, I understand this resolution um, is required because the district is then uh, required to allocate approximately $100,000 for the cost of an election. Is that correct? It is. Thank you. Just wanted that noted. That's all. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Entertain a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Any further questions? Ms. Huff, would you please call the vote? Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board President Lockerbie? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. <laughs> uh, so moving on, uh, on to item number six, board discussions regarding the 2022-23 state of the schools. Is that Dr. Smith or is that Madam President? That would be Madam, Madam President. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted the board to have the opportunity to talk about this board, be able to talk about what they would like the state of the schools to look like for this year. Um, personally, I would like us to um, maintain the uh, vision and inspiration um, that Ms. Travanti brought um, in bringing the state of the schools to us. And I know that she worked very hard with um, Mr. Hammond also to bring, the, uh, to bring that that vision, that concept, that inspiration, inspirational um, idea to the district. And um, I want to make sure to maintain the, the, the basic, the legacy. This is a legacy that Ms. Travanti brought to this district. Um, while doing that, I'd also like to give this board the opportunity to give their input what they would like the state of the schools to look like. Um, what they, I would like the board to share what they want the state of the schools to do. So w what is the objective? What is the outcome, the expected outcome? How do you want that to look? How do you want the information to be delivered? So I'd like to um, initiate a discussion along those lines. So we're, the discussion is not doing away with the state of the schools. The Absolutely not. The discussion is how we want this or what we want it to look like for this, this year's state of the schools. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Obviously, you know where I stand. Um, I feel like transparency and accountability are, are, are two very important things for a governing body like us, um, and you know, the president does it for State of the Union, the city here in Monrovia does it for the city um, that highlights and, and recognizes and celebrates, um, but recognizes areas for improvement and the policy agenda for the following year. Um, I think that it goes a long way with um, enhan enhanced communication the benefit of providing us information, in providing information to the public, it gives them an opportunity to think about the decisions that we've made throughout the year. We're human, we have short memories. <laughs> what we did 
10 months ago is so off the radar. And that's why it's important to wrap everything up in one evening with all, you know, all the hard work that staff has done, the decisions and driving decisions that the board has made. It's really important to speak to that to the public. They have to have that knowledge. And of course, a state of the um, school's address is now a public record. And here comes the uh, accountability piece. Whatever we speak to there, we do need to be held accountable as a board and as a district. Um, and we recently had a public comment of someone refer referencing something in last year's State of the Schools. And I personally like that. I want us to be held accountable. So another reason um, to have the State of the Schools. Now, how are we going to do this? Uh, we've done, a, done it a variety of ways since it started in 2019. First year in the auditorium there at the high school. And we had a little bit of a glitch um, because the sound was not recorded correctly. <laughs> um, we got past that, but it was, it was a nice inaugural event. Um, the second year, 2020, of course, we all know what happened in 2020. <laughs> um, but we went in there to the auditorium and we recorded. And then we produced this video. And then last year, we were finally back into the auditorium, invited uh, the community in to, to um, watch us. And it was nicely recorded. Um, but going forward, maybe we can you know, do it in a hybrid format so that we have um, we have it in person for those that choose to and those that want to uh, watch it from home, the comfort of, the, of their home. So, I mean, I'm open to different ideas for sure, but I, I'm, I'm glad to hear this wasn't a discussion to do away with the state of the schools. Now we want to preserve okay. your legacy, your hard right. work. Well, um, I, the, I, last, I just, the last three, um, despite the glitches and despite mm -hmm. COVID, have been beautiful, yeah. And um, as you said, it's really important to 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 convey the state of our schools, and um, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, but I just want us to um, be able to discuss. There are a bright, there are an infinite number of ways that we can do that, and I just wanted um, to you know have input and um, discuss different ways that we would might like to, to implement that. May I suggest that um, since the president takes, will take center stage during the um, state of the schools, that a committee of two people, um, the president and one other, organize what the president's visions for that year's state of the school will look like. Um, I think us trying to hash out the details in April for what it is that you want it to be when the vision of what the what you want it to look like will change by the individual who's sitting in the center seat. So I mean it's up to the you know you're gonna have it so I think what we should probably do is lock in a date and then as close as possible, stay to that date so that you have the expectation from the community that this is when it happens, that's one. Number two, pick the venue. High school seems to work, but maybe it's another place. Pick your venue, make sure it's open. Um, also consult the community calendar to make sure you're not competing with something else at the time. But I think it would be, you know, I think since it was Maritza's idea as long as she's on the board, I think it should be the Maritza and the board president, whoever that may be, working on putting the state of the schools together. And so that way the president gets their vision of what they want to be able to communicate and so on down the line. I think that's the easiest way to do it. I, I, I appreciate the input. That's, um, that is good input. Um, I would like to hear some other suggestions about um, uh, from the rest of the board about what they might like to see um, with the suggestion that Mr. Hammond has. has. Can, 
can you clarify what you're looking for? Well, there are so so I have some ideas. Um, Do you want to share that? I, I, well, I I don't want to dominate things. I want this to be the opportunity for all of the board to talk, but I do have some ideas. Um, and I, I don't want to start. Well, that's kind of why I, I said I think it'd be beneficial if the board president got together with the other member and hashed them out, then brought it to the board and is this okay? I would be fine with that because at this point in time, my concern is, like Marissa said, it's it's accountability, transparency, bringing it to communication, bringing it to the public and making sure that the access to the information is there. The way we do that isn't necessarily as important to me, although I, I do like having things in person. Um, so hybrid might be a good solution if we're concerned about that. But the, the details at this point in time aren't, I'm not super married to any of that so if you have some vision i'm more than happy to to listen to it and and go from there instead of just throw out ideas i i have some vision if you're comfortable with me sharing them i'm fine with fine with that i don't want to um i don't want to drive the vision um but i'll share with you and maybe that can start some things off and start um, a dialogue um first of all i'd like to so when I think of um, the state of the schools, I think that what we want to do, based on what Maritza has shared with us, is we want to inform, we want to engage, we want to retain and attract. And so when I was thinking about all of those things, um, I was starting to think of how, how do we inform, how do we engage the community, um, how do we um, attract from other communities into our community? Um, and I started, as I started to think about that, I realized that it started to sound like what was starting, uh, uh, the concept that was starting, um, started to sound like the showcase that Dr. Smith was interested in doing um, a few months ago that I think COVID derailed, I think COVID derailed. Um, but I was starting to think about at the state of the schools, having our students there um, to showcase what they do. So what is the state of our schools? Here is the state of our schools, what our kids are doing at every level, at, from every site. So have a sort of showcase idea. That is one of the ideas that I had so that our kids are there, our parents are there, um, along with the board, the cabinet, the staff. Um, I would love to be able to further engage the community. One of the ways that I think best engages, uh, best creates fellowship is food. So, uh, right? Food is fellowship. Uh, so I was thinking about um, food, how we could get food there. Um, Reason, uh, reasonably priced, so I was thinking food trucks. Um, I would go to almost any district event if it meant that I didn't have to cook dinner. Um, so be able to bring more of the community to hear the message. Um, and I also wanted to uh, talk about if that is something that the board would be interested in doing. Um, would we want to have it replace the showcase, be the showcase idea? Would we want to merge those those ideas? Or would we want to have this state of the schools like this and then a showcase at a later date? And what is the date that we want to have the state of the schools? Because the state of the schools is normally in October. It, it's been in October, but this last year was in November. Is. Yeah, it was pushed. So Just, do we want to... When when do we want to have State of the Schools? Do we still want to have it in October? October seemed important. to work well before, but again, I think it's consulting calendars and and, and all of that. We, um, the Monrovia Coordinating Council, you know, that's it's going to be important because we want the community to join right. us. It's not just our district family, right. but the entire community. So. We yeah, would have to the consult. entire community and other communities. I'd yeah. love to mm -hmm. give every opportunity we can to, sorry to overuse this word, but to really showcase 
our kids because that showcases our school district. So I would love if this is such a big event and such a well-publicized event, I want it to continue to be well attended, attended by more, and I want the reach to go further and further. You, know, you talked about um, advertising CELC. I just, every opportunity to advertise our schools, I really want to um, take that opportunity um, and take it as far as we can. So I've started off with, <laughs> with that. Does that um, prime any further conversation? I'm happy to work with you, so do just let me know. I would like some time to just let it sort of percolate. Um, it, it sounds good, but it's it's like you said, it's a starting point, and so um, you know maybe you and and Maritza or or whomever you want to work with, sit down and and you know come up with a a plan based on this, and and that'll give us some time to say, hey, we thought about this, or have you considered that, or or um, you so, know, because we've got a lot of time. Well, not. A ton of time. No, no, no. But but it's time for us to right, be able to, to be add and this. and and it's not tomorrow. Okay. So I will express this concern. Um, we've been very careful with the timing of this event mm -hmm. and not going over maybe an hour, hour and fifteen minutes max. We realize it's a weeknight. We realize everybody's busy. It's typically during dinner time or could be during dinner time. So we've been cognizant of that in the past. It, it sounds like what you're planning is maybe a lengthier evening. So just, just something well, to think about. We could do it on a Friday. We could, we could do it on a Saturday. Mm. Something, something to think about because, you know, I don't, I don't want our community to be here for two hours, three hours, four hours either. But so something to think about. So let me ask um, the board. So we're thinking about things now um, and thinking about the input that we can give and the input that we can share. How do we bring our thoughts back together? Do we discuss it? Do we put it on the next agenda? Um, I'll go back to something um, Rob mentioned. In the last few years, it's been the board president and myself, or Rob, and we've worked together on it. So you so, and Rob for the last yeah. three years have done it? Um, well, no, last year it was me and Ryan, um, bringing him up to speed on it and then you know working with BMA, the marketing firm that we had. So it was the really the three of us. Prior to that, um, I wasn't board president two years ago. Um, it was, was it Ed? I can't remember. <laughs> it had to have been, yeah, it had to have been Ed and Kathy working on it with BMA, yeah. So it's always been the board president and then maybe one other person. You know, Rob and I worked together on the inaugural one. It was me and Ryan this last year because I was board president. Okay, so if Ryan and I worked on it, that's acceptable. I think it would. I think it would be beneficial to have Maritza in there as well, um, and and not to change any of if you have a vision of what you want to do. Right. I I think your proposals are fine. Okay. You 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 do what you want to do, and then it has to come. It's going to come here. This is what we're going to do, and then if we see go. Uh oh. Like then you, then you will say something, but I I don't see an issue with what you are planning. Um, I just wanted, you know, I just wanted there to be board input. I, I, you know, I just wanted there to be a collective vision. But I, I wanted to give the opportunity for there to be a collective vision about this. But I think the way to do it is to get yourself and Maritza together, and then you guys discuss what it is, and then it's framed up and it's sent to us. And if anybody has an issue with it, you go, bye. Oh, I think I have an issue here, but you know, trying to manufacture a problem out of thin air is hard. 
Trying, say that again? Trying to manufacture a Trying problem. Trying to manufacture a problem out of thin air is hard to do. So if you say, I have an idea about this, well, okay, I have no thought about it yet, so I don't know if there's an issue. You know, when I see a 100-year storm, I see an issue. I haven't uh, previously, in the previous three years, I haven't, I don't think it's been agendized. It's just sort of happened. I haven't been the president. Um, so I just want well, to there was a, There was I an don't. extreme amount of time in the background to get it in to get it out. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of time. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It so, wasn't an, an agenda action item, but it's always been in pending board issues. Mm -hmm. It's always been on the calendar for pending board issues. Yeah. Okay. So. Just, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we're transparent with each other. And, you know, I want to give the opportunity for everyone I actually uh, appreciate you bringing it forward from the standpoint that I did not have the history. Um, and I don't know that in my memory it seemed that there was something similar but not done by the board. It was each site that had to do a state of schools a, a for their ago. community, of uh, their school community. So I appreciate just learning the history of um, the origin and the intent. Um, and moving forward, I think that that would be acceptable to have you kind of bring some form to to your idea of, of what it should look like next year, well, 2022, October six 22, months, yeah. yeah, six months. Um, and then we give feedback to something that is a little bit more formulated. So give it more of a form. Yeah. And how do I bring it back to you all, to us all, with more of a form? Just tell us what night we have to be someplace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm that. That's what I'm trying to avoid. So we we uh, created the framework already. If if you are suggesting to change it, that's fine. The only real change I made last year was adding the student voice, having our um, both our student board reps speak. Um, the teacher of the year, you know, we have um, that teacher speak. That started from the very beginning. Um, and then the board president identified kind of the narrative of, of the event, and then the topics were divided among the, the five of us that we were going to speak to. Um, so that's kind of what's happened the last few years. So if you have a different vision, then, you know, So it's go. the president's vision? Yeah. I mean, it's your legacy. So I just want to make sure that I understand. I understand it and understand that if it's the board's, uh, if it's the president's prerogative, I just think then it's that's what I understand now yeah. is that it's the president's prerogative. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate everyone's time and um, get, giving me the history as well. And I really appreciate your, your, the legacy that you have brought. Moving on to information items. May I, are there any questions about or discussion? Board policy 0400, board policies. Uh, on the agenda listed as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. And I'm asking it that way because if we don't have any questions, it doesn't require a vote. So I'm asking if there is any discussion or questions on any of the board policies that are under the information item category? Because all of these are first readings. Mm -hmm. the, right. Yes. Okay. Ms. So Fuller, any, did, did you Are, are you good, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, not 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, mostly for providing these for us well in advance because it gave me the opportunity to read through them carefully. Um, I really appreciated having them several weeks in advance before before the first reading. So thank you, and thank you for all the hard work. This was an enormous amount of, of effort. So this, this is the first read for all of them. There are no more questions or comments. So can you please bring these back in um, action? Or consent. 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 On consent. On consent. Yes. Thank you. Would be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And so that will move us to future meeting dates. Regular Board of Education meeting April twenty seventh, May eleventh. Madam President, I think yes. pending board issues. I beg your pardon. I'm moving on to pending board issues. Board of Education will receive status information on identified tasks and review issues of interest for future attention. Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Just a few things to highlight. Uh, number one, as a reminder, the board recently completed a revision of its mission and vision. And currently, um, it is my pleasure to be working with the board on now taking the next step and identifying some key focus areas that will serve as core foundational element for the strategic plan that we will develop. And those focus areas will, eventually a team will come together to develop real specific goals, actions, and measurements in terms of how we're ma making progress towards those. So very excited. Um, along with that, we'll be spending some time with the board on identifying some core values as well. And together that will make up the framework for the strategic plan that will begin the process of develop developing next year. Uh, the other thing that I would like to uh, share with the board is that at our next meeting, we'll be providing a presentation on what we're calling at the moment uh, 21st century classroom environments or learning environments, uh, where we'd like to share some information with the board about a vision related to how we can take classroom spaces and integrate technology, furniture, flexible spaces, those kinds of things, uh, to really bring our vision for personalized learning innovative innovation and things like that uh, to a reality. So we're excited to share a little bit more about what we have in mind and how we'd like to go about starting that process and where we think eventually it will it will take us. We think the board will really enjoy that. Um, I certainly hope you hope you will. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that the development of our LCAP is ongoing. We are now in the phase, I believe, where we have surveys going out and we're encouraging as many of our stakeholders to complete those as possible. So just wanted to highlight those few things from this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Now moving on to future meeting dates, April 27th, May 11th, May 25th, the regular Board of Education meetings. May 19th is a joint personnel commission and Board of Education meeting. I believe that that is a Thursday. Am I correct? That is a Thursday. Um, moving on to new business, open houses. We have already had several, be, been able to attend several open houses. That's CELC, Clifton, uh, MHS, Bayflower, Monroe. Yeah, yes. open houses. Yes. Yes. So we've already had the opportunity to attend those. And then coming. I'm sorry, I do have something for new business. So whenever you want Absolutely. me to. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we have open houses, uh, Wild Rose. Um, it... Yes? We're okay? You okay? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over. <laughs> well, let, me, let me get through this. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm just noticing, maybe it's my fault to just notice now. We have a joint uh, personnel Commission meeting scheduled the same evening afternoon of the So All May Read event. Fundraiser? So, yes. Fundraisers at 6 30? Six, yeah. Six, 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 six thirty. Yeah. The joint personnel meeting is at four. They're not usually terribly long. That's my understanding. Is fast? I, I, I mean, then I'm yeah. good because I. I 
can't be in two places at once. You can't, you can't be in two no. places at once. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, new business, Open Houses, Wild Rose School of Creative Arts is April 21st at 5.30. Plymouth is the April 26th. Brad Oaks, April 26th also at 6.15 p.m. And Santa Fe Computer Science Magnet, May 26th. Mr. Vonti, you have something for new business? Yes, President Lockerbie um, and Dr. Smith, my request is that if um, whenever you feel uh, we can calendar this, but to invite the um, policy review committee that's been in place for well over a year and a half now working um, oh. on our policies are and make, ensuring that they are you know, with an equity lens on our policies. And these are all community members that have been volunteering their time doing this. And um, I think it would be really great if we could bring them into one of our board meetings to recognize Thank what you. they've been doing. So thank you very much for that. I'm moving on to other dates to calendar, uh, Superstars of Music Showcase at the Taylor Performing Arts Center will be May 12th at 6.30. It's an amazing evening that showcases all of our musical talent in our district. Um, it, it is really a wonderful evening. I hope that you all can make it. You don't have to have kids in the music program in the district to really enjoy this. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that. And as Dr. Smith, Smith mentioned earlier, Monrovia Days, Parade and Festival are the 13th through the 15th. I'd like to ask the board, um, will we be in a pie eating contest? Can I get a commitment from the board? No commitments? No commitments on the pie eating. The parade. Just parade. <laughs> Just the parade. And, uh, no? Is it no, I, is it, was it I a, like a? I have <laughs> pie <laughs> in my nose. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, and then Memorial Day, all sites are closed. That is May 30th. Are there any other uh, items to address this evening? Hearing none or seeing none, I would like to close tonight's meeting in memory of former MUSD employee, Mr. Oscar Bullock. Mr. Bullock passed away recently on March 19th at the age of 97 years old. Oscar served the district as a custodian for 25 years and then Brad Oaks, Brad Oaks Elementary School and Monrovia High School before retiring as lead custodian at Monrovia Adult School in 1991. Mr. Bullock leaves behind a host of family, friends, and of course his MUSD family. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Bullock family at this time. With nothing else, I will adjourn the regular Board of Education open session meeting at... 8.48 p.m.